This video is sponsored by Skillshare. The first 500 people to go to skl.sh slash polyphonic17 will get two months of Skillshare for free. There's no song in the American canon like George Gershwin's Summertime. It's a simple piece, but a powerful one, evoking a hot summer day in the American South, but hinting at so much more. And that evocative ability has led it to become one of the most widely recorded songs in the history of music. Some have estimated that there have been more than 25,000 different recordings of the song, and new versions are being cut every day. From Billie Holiday through Nina Simone, from Ella Fitzgerald through Janis Joplin, Summertime is more than just a song. It's a living document of America's cultural history. Let's take a closer look. Summertime was one of the first songs that George Gershwin wrote for his opera Porgy and Bess. It's used as a theme throughout that opera, sung by several characters as the tragic story plays out. The lyrics are written by Edwin Dubose Hayward, who also wrote Porgy, from which the opera was adapted. That novel tells the story of several black characters in the American South. So when Gershwin set out to create a musical adaptation, he turned to black folk musics. Gershwin was writing in the early 1930s when jazz music had exploded into the mainstream. Gershwin himself had been part of this explosion a few years earlier with Rhapsody in Blue. Mixing jazz influences with classical music in the European tradition, Gershwin brought black jazz to white audiences with his Rhapsody. But while that song is wild and bombastic, Summertime is calm and nuanced. This is because of its influences from the African American spiritual tradition. Tracing their origins back to the slave trade, spiritual songs had existed in the black zeitgeist for generations. One such song was Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. Haywood's original Porgy novel featured that song, so Gershwin used part of its melody as inspiration for Summertime. You can hear the similarities in Mahalia Jackson's take on Summertime, which incorporates some of Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. Like a motherless child. Summertime made its premiere alongside the rest of Porgy and Bess on September 30th, 1935, sung by Abby Mitchell. The legacy of Porgy and Bess is a complicated one. To this day, many still take issue to Gershwin, a Jewish man, using black music and purporting to depict black life in his opera. But black communities were quick to latch on to Summertime with its lilting melody and timeless music. Just a year after Porgy and Bess premiered, a young Billie Holiday took on the song. Holiday's version is more reflective of the swinging jazz scene that was happening around her at the time. A raspy trumpet drives the song instead of the dramatic strings. Holiday's Summertime has moved from the rural countryside of Gershwin's original. With driving drums and an upbeat sound, Holiday's version is the sound of summer in her home of Harlem. This is a reflection of a social movement that was happening at the time known as the Great Migration. With the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and Jim Crow laws in the South, many black Americans were moving to industrial centers in the North. Alongside these people came cultural movements too. Chicago quickly became the jazz capital of the world, and a new movement that would come to be known as the Harlem Renaissance was happening in New York. By channeling the vibrant black culture around her, Holiday was able to break the American pop charts, climbing to number 12. Her version was the first take on Summertime to accomplish this feat, but it wouldn't be the last. It would take some years for Summertime to get momentum though. Only a few artists took on the song in the following years as the Second World War fell over the globe. But in the post-war, Summertime found new life as jazz began a new wave of experimentation. 1955 saw Dinah Washington release an astounding version of the song carried by Clifford Brown's otherworldly trumpeting. Two years later, Sam Cooke would bring the song into the soul realm with his own charting version. All of these versions helped bring more attention to the song, but it wasn't until 1958 that Summertime truly became immortal. That was when two of the giants of American music history teamed up to turn the song into a duet. Ella Fitzgerald had spent the 1950s earning her nickname the Queen of Jazz. Jazz was reaching a point of popularity that it would never hit again, and Ella was a big reason behind that. The bebop movement had allowed her to shine. She would use her voice to imitate the kind of improvisations she heard from the horns. 
add in a powerful cadence and a regal stage presence, and it was enough to raise Fitzgerald to immortality. It seemed too good to be true when, in 1956, Ella Fitzgerald teamed up with the other biggest name in jazz. By this time, Louis Armstrong had been dominant in jazz scenes for three decades. In the 20s, he taught the world how to swing with his unparalleled trumpeting, and through the 30s, his iconic voice shaped the sound of jazz crooners for decades to come. So when he paired up with Ella Fitzgerald, the world watched. They released two albums of collaboration before turning their eyes on Gershwin and releasing Porgy and Bess full of songs from the opera. Fitzgerald had covered Summertime before in a version full of her trademarked improvisation, but this was different. The slow strings at the beginning seem to be announcing that Louis and Ella are about to change the world. There's a desperate, near apocalyptic sound to Armstrong's horn playing that's calmed by Fitzgerald's warm voice. For many, this remains the definitive version of the song to date. But Armstrong and Fitzgerald weren't all there was to jazz in the late 1950s. Jazz was also going through a drastic shift helmed by the likes of Miles Davis, who released his own Porgy and Bess album in 1959. Davis was always looking for new ways to push jazz forward, and in 59, he realized he could do so by looking back at Gershwin. Davis thought the increasing complexities of bebop were getting in the way of creativity, so he sought a return to melody. He found this return in Porgy and Bess, the second of his collaborations with Gil Evans. With Gershwin's chord progressions as the bass, Davis created beautiful improvisations. His take on Summertime was a prelude to his next album, also released in 1959, The World-Changing Kind of Blue. While established artists like Davis were taking on the song, an up-and-comer named Nina Simone was starting her own legacy with Gershwin tunes. Though she got famous for a take on I Loves You Porgy, Simone would also put her own spin on Summertime. Her version reflects the brooding darkness within the song, and the violence that was growing in America. Over the next few years, Simone would become a key figure in the civil rights movement. Alongside the likes of Sam Cooke, Simone's music provided a soundtrack to the marches, rallies, and protests that ended up changing American history. The civil rights movement was just one of many pieces that made the 1960s such a tumultuous decade for America. Alongside the fight for black equality, women were rising up, and many youths were taking action against the Vietnam War. Where soul music was the backdrop to the civil rights movement, psychedelia was the backdrop to the sexual revolution. And one of the definitive versions of Summertime would reflect this, bringing the song from a history of jazz and soul into the world of rock. In 1968, Big Brother and the Holding Company released Cheap Thrills. That album featured a searing version of Summertime. Peter Albin's fuzzy guitar pairs with desperate vocals by Janis Joplin. This isn't the rural summertime of the South, but it also isn't Billie Holiday's bustling Harlem summertime. This is the summer of San Francisco, drugs in the air and protest in the street. Joplin would perform the song throughout her career, bringing a jazz classic to an all-new generation. And by the time Joplin's version was released, it was clear that this wasn't a Gershwin song any longer. Summertime no longer belonged to Billie Holiday or Ella and Louie. It wasn't a Miles Davis track either, nor was it Janis Joplin's. By the end of the 60s, Summertime was everyone's song. It belonged to whoever wanted to put their own spin on it, whoever wanted to sing of their summertime. And with each passing version, the legacy of Summertime grows. It's a vibrant, diverse, never-ending story, contained in one simple song. Making this video made me want to take my own run at covering Summertime. If watching it put you in the same boat, you can get some help with Kurt Berg's Fingerstyle Guitar for Beginners on Skillshare. Personally, I love fingerstyle guitar, and I think Summertime is a great song to try out fingerstyle. Or maybe it's not making music you're interested in, but rather talking about it. I get requests for videos all the time, so there's a clear desire for more music video essayists. I genuinely recommend you give it a shot if you've got the passion. If you want to learn some of the know-how, Nikki Stevens' course on creative video storytelling and editing is a great resource. That course will teach you how to tell visual stories without having to shoot your own video. 
If neither of these appeal to you, I'm sure you can find something else up your alley. Skillshare offers thousands of courses on a whole range of topics. You could step up your cooking game, improve your productivity, or work on your writing skills. Whatever you want to learn, Skillshare is the best place online to do it. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to more than 25,000 topics, and now you can try it out absolutely free. The first 500 people to go to the link in the description will get two months of Skillshare free of charge. Using that link will also show Skillshare that I sent you, which is a big help to my channel, so please just give it a shot.